Hi everyone, it's Raina. So this video is looking at the natal chart of Laura Nero, who is best known, I think, as a songwriter for other artists who scored big hits with her material. An example would be uh, The Fifth Dimension, which did several of her songs, such as Stone Soul Picnic and Wedding Bell Blues, Sweet Blindness. So I, I, I can't, you know, it's funny, I can't remember exactly how I started listening to Laura Nero <laughs> 50 years after she made a splash, or even more than 50 years. For the last few years, and I'm recording this in 2022, I've been... I don't know if you call it upset, probably obsessed, but I've been just drawn to music from uh, between the years like 1969 and 1972. And it's just the strangest thing. I didn't plan it. It just happened. Uh, and she was one of those people who was always on my radar. I always would hear about her because, you know, back in the day reading Rolling Stone magazine and, it, you know, they were singing her praises even in the 80s. Um, but when I'm saying even in the eighties, because she really didn't get the kind of, um, positive press that she deserved when she was really at her artistic peak, if you want to call it that. Um, and she was quite young when she entered the business, the music business in the first place. So she was very precocious in that regard. Um, so it just blew my mind hearing these songs because I had never heard them before after 50 years. And, you know, being somebody that was listening to music in the seventies and the eighties and never hearing these songs, even by these artists. So, um, the internet has been good for that. Uh, and it has given these artists their proper due. So some people may have no idea who I'm talking about. Oh, she also um, wrote the song Eli's Coming for uh, Three Dog Night and When I Die uh, by um, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. She wrote that song. And uh, somebody that they mentioned along the same lines is Randy Newman, who, you know, it, it, sometimes people are very quirky in their... Uh, musical sensibilities. And so they're not necessarily commercial in their own regard, but they can, you know, crank out some tunes and especially other people, they might um, kind of uh, arrange the song in their own way. So it does, you know, uh, an example is Bob Dylan. People have done covers of Bob Dylan and they changed... Um, uh, they didn't do it exactly as he's sung it. Uh, they changed things and made it into pop hits. Whereas the original might not have been so much. So anyway, um, I, I'm reading a biography of hers just to try to uh, gain a handle on, you know, what she was all about. And I haven't finished it, but it's very, very strange because it's hard to really understand who she was at a core level. I think that she was a very private person and that might be a lot of what is going on here. And what frustrates me too is that when I look at her chart, I can see things that might have even been related to trauma from her childhood and whatnot. And yet the biography didn't mention that. But when I look at her picture, and I don't claim to be a psychic or anything, but I just feel like she went through something and I, but there was no mention of that, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Sometimes uh, there's uh, like one big traumatic event and the family never speaks about it to anyone, or maybe they didn't know it happened or it was between her and a certain person and nobody else knew about it. Um, and she did have Mercury in Scorpio, so she was probably, she was quite tight-lipped. I mean, uh, I did read 
about, you know, examples of that where, where she didn't really talk too much about her life. I guess she was, um, with, uh, Jackson Brown for a while and he was just beginning his career and she didn't explain why they broke up or anything like that. Um, so she might have been a very tight-lipped individual in that regard uh, about her business. So anyway, Laura uh, was born in the Bronx, New York, and there's a there's a song. I think it's called Coffee Mornings. I can't I can't remember. Great song. Definitely check it out on YouTube. And at the beginning, she announces that she's doing that song. And you can hear her thick New York accent. And it's hilarious because, again, you know, she kind of cuts this ethereal kind of a picture uh, or image, you know, of somebody who's kind of this flower child. Uh, not that she was necessarily a hippie, but they she was characterized by people who knew her as being a very free spirit. And she, she was a sun in Libra and she had the moon in Sagittarius. And it's interesting because she did have Scorpio energy in her inner planets. And I, I thought since she was born on October 18th, that for sure she was a late degree Libra, but actually she was only 23 degrees, if you can believe that. So it just goes to show that, um, Sometimes Scorpio season doesn't begin until I think the 24th of October, 23rd, something like that. But, um, so she, she had the moon in Sagittarius and, um, she had Leo rising. So this is a triple masculine energy. She wore a lot of dresses though interestingly enough, in an era when women were wearing pants quite readily. And I say that because before the 60s, uh, women in pants was not like that uh, commonplace, maybe if they were really at home. So you used to call them dungarees, you know, the jeans. Um, so her Mercury in Scorpio, Venus in Scorpio. And, uh, let's see, Mercury and Venus. Okay. I was wondering if the Mercury and Venus formed a conjunction, but apparently not. And her Mars in Leo and she had Leo rising. Now this is another an anomaly because for somebody with Leo rising, now she did apparently have a very dramatic delivery on stage in the early days. And um, I have gotten to a point in the book, in the uh, biography where she, I don't know, maybe the mid seventies or something like that. And she was more subdued and, you know, some critics were a little bit um, disappointed in that because they were, they were looking for the theatrics or something, but she, um, she really, I think she did have stage fright because I, I might be wrong about this, but I don't think she toured that much overall. And, you know, it's possible that as I read the end of the book, she will, it will show that she toured more. Um, I don't think she, I was going to say maybe she needed the money, but I don't think that she did because um, she she cut a deal early in her career, which earned her millions of dollars. And that was, you know, around 1970. So that you can imagine how far that went back then. I think it was more the case that she probably felt like she had to perform, that that was a part of her. You know, with Mars in Leo, there's going to be that real push or desire for that kind of uh, creative self-expression, you know, being a performer in general. Interestingly enough, she has no planets in the fifth house of creativity, and she was a consummate artist. She was also like a literal, uh, when I say artist, you know, I'm thinking of the, uh, 
the painting and drawing. I, I, in the book, they had one of her drawings. It was excellent. And she did go to a creative high school and, um, or what, you know, what they call like, it wasn't the, the fame, you know, the, the, the school that the high school that the, the kids that they made the movie fame out of, that was another one in New York city. This was a different one, but it was in New York, you know, in New York. And um, that's for people who are aspiring to have a career in the creative arts. They're really serious about it, you know. And um, and she, I I can't. I think she might have gotten accepted as, or she she tried to um, enroll or you know put in her her uh, material as a a drawer, not a. Uh, like that type of artist, not as a musician, but I think she got accepted as a musician. So, you know, she really saw herself in that. She had a relative who was an artist uh, in that regard. And she all, her father was a musician, so she did have a an artistic family background, for sure. Um, so... Um, Her Mercury was in Scorpio, Venus in Scorpio, Mars in Leo, and Leo rising. Um, she had a square between Venus and Mars, and she, I think she, 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 she um, ended, I think at the end of her life, of course, I haven't read the whole book, but I think she was living with a woman. She was, I don't know if she considers herself a full-blown lesbian or uh, bisexual because she did, um, get married at one point and she kind of retired and she was in her twenties when she did that for about five years. And then she came back and was doing things. I don't know if she really stayed away for five years though, but, um, so she was, and she did have, uh, affairs with men and relationships with men. So you could call that bisexual. She had a child, uh, but she did, eventually um have a relationship with a woman and that was how it ended i believe they were still together at the time of her untimely death in her 40s dying from the same disease as her mother ovarian cancer so um obviously libra as her sun sign is going to be uh interested at the very least in the arts and in her case downright immersed in them um i'm really thinking that mercury more and more is connected to creativity as well because it is the mind and the mind is the thing that comes up with ideas and the third house is the house is one of the houses that mercury rules third house is the house of gemini and it's the house of the mind, and it's the house of communication. Laura had the sun here, she had Venus here, and she had Neptune here. So uh, the sun is your being. Now, you, you know, this could very well be the placement of a creative writer, or even a teacher in some cases. The Neptune part would make them more maybe of a a teacher of creative writing or something like that, where they want to, um, you know, Neptune is very, is not really linear. It's more imaginative and, um, you know, receptive, receiving information from the higher realms. This is somebody who has a very intuitive mind, not necessarily a practical mind, but an intuitive one. So a person like this, who's artistic, they know it's almost like a meditation to kind of have those ideas drawn to that person so that they can communicate them to others. Venus is here. Did I say Venus is here? Uh, and you know, really the, the wonderful thing about Venus in the third house is the pleasure that a person takes about the, about ideas. So the life of the mind but not for the sake of the intellectual uh, aspect of it. This is about, well, maybe that's wrong for me to say because 
with the sun being here, the person is going to have that intellectual side to themselves. And when a person does open themselves up in that way, they're going to have a rich palette from which to choose, um, you know, their themes. Uh, if you think about a poet, for instance, and this could be the poet and her lyrics, you know, can be very poetical. Even from a young age, she was very sophisticated in that regard. Um, if, if, uh, you know, I was a big, uh, fan of poetry from a young age, used to do poetry slams, no plants in the third house, but I can say that the poets, especially, you know, they always had this connection to other disciplines. I mean, other subject matters, like maybe they were into mythology or maybe they were into, um, even history or the, they have like a background so that they, they are informed about their subject matter. Um, they're not just, they can write about a wide variety of things and same with a novelist. So this could be the position of a novelist, but even a teacher who can, um, I can, a literature teacher, the third house is elementary school, high school, more than the opposite house, the ninth house, which is academia, which is the college experience. But also we could say abstract knowledge. So it's more, you know, less about mundane information or knowledge than it is about the, um, the more um, philosophical side of life. And I'm also wondering if the third house could be connected to singing. She was a singer. She wasn't just a composer. She was a singer. And she had a very um, intense emotional delivery. And so to me, that dovetails very nicely with having Mercury and Scorpio. The voice, you know. Third house is your voice. But I mean, you know, what you want to express to others. But sometimes the emotions speak louder than words. So I just want to, speaking of emotions, I just want to touch upon what I'm wondering about in her private life, because she had Saturn um, probably on the ascendant. No, I get, I, uh, yeah. So she had Saturn on the ascendant, but she didn't grow up with austerity. Um, and she, and she didn't seem to have a household that was very strict. So it's very interesting. Like, what does that represent? You know, uh, or what was going on at that time that, you know, might've been oppressive or might've felt like made her feel like she was overly serious. If you look at her expression though, a lot of times it's not like her just with a cheesy smile. It's very kind of like, I wouldn't say scowling, but you know, kind of a serious expression on her face. So because this is forming a conjunction with the ascendant, that Saturnine type of uh, appearance. And even the I think um, Saturn on the Ascendant can be kind of swarthy. She had a swarthy uh, complexion. I don't know if I'm correct about that, but um, I mean, if that's what it means. Oh, but you know, here's the thing. I'll tell you this. She also had Pluto coming from the 12th house on the Ascendant. So that could be really that swarthiness, but also that intensity. So these, the she had Saturn and Pluto in conjunction. Pluto coming from the 12th and Saturn from the first. And um, Saturn, uh, I'm sorry, um, Pluto in the 12th, I think maybe it is um, karmic residue. Who knows? I mean, it could be. And that's why the person has such kind of like this, this heaviness about themselves because I'm talking about emotionally 
because they still are, they still have some things to uh, process from a past lifetime, but it also can point to deeply buried trauma in this lifetime. So buried, unlike the eighth house, which can be the subconscious memory, but the 12th house can be the unconscious memory. So buried that the person has no knowledge of it. This does happen. And some of you may have even experienced this where, um, there's a very deep trauma and at a certain time in the person's life, it emerges. And, um, a prime example of this is sexual abuse, maybe a rape, something that is very, very traumatic. And maybe when the person is uh, very young and they just cannot make sense of it. And so the, the psyche does that as a protective device so that when the person is more capable of processing, processing it, they can and it might take until adulthood. And I remember reading this woman say that she completely repressed something or something like that. And when her, she had a, um, a daughter, when her daughter got to the age where she was abused, then she, the memory started flooding in. Um, it's really wild how that can happen because to me, it's like, how can you suddenly remember something? But I, you know, I think about, you know, it's funny because the 12th house is the dream state. And I have, I don't feel like I dream hardly at all, but I have had times where I know I've dreamt something and I don't remember it. Or, and then like later in the day, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I had this dream, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I'll have dream recall but something will trigger that dream recall. So I guess it, that's how it works. It's like you're, you do have it filed away, but you need something to jog your memory, you know, in a sense. And then she has Mars here and that can be violence. And, you know, like I said, they're in conjunction, but there's no evidence of it from the biography that she had this in her family life or any thing going on. I just, I, you know, I'm just telling it like it is. I mean, that's what I, uh, I see there. And at the very least, somebody who has Mars in conjunction with Pluto is going to be very like intense about going after their goals. Um, they just have that sense of, um, you know, like there's, there's a very powerful, um, desire and maybe even you could say, I, in some cases it's like desire for power, but, um, I just think, you know, in her case it was creative because it was in the sign of Leo, which was her, which was her ascendant as well. And that's why I say, I don't think that she was very, very, um, extroverted. I think she might've been quite shy. So it is possible to have Leo rising and not be very, uh, extroverted, but she was in show business. So how can you say that she was completely shy? And also when she was on stage, she was very, you know, in that, what we would call her heyday, she was very dramatic and that's Leo for sure. And, um, and I, and I would say, you know, with the Leo energy of that conjunction between Mars and Pluto too, as well as the ascendant, I, I would say that anybody who immediately, you know, graduates high school and they know, I mean, they're not even, uh, oh, did she enroll in college briefly? She might have, I, I, I can't even remember. I read books and I don't even remember. But she, but she went into, she wanted to, to be a songwriter and that's exactly what she did and a, and a performer. And that's exactly what she did. So she did not waste any time after she graduated high school in doing that and pursuing that. That's what she wanted. And so going after what you want, I would say, is that conjunction between Mars and Pluto. And, um, and also, you know, she did have these affairs and that's, you know, that sexual, there was like a, a sensuality in some of her songs that was reflected in her real life. 
Uh, but it wasn't the kind of thing that you see nowadays where it's in your face, you know, twerking. Uh, I know I sound like I'm a hundred years old and I'm being moralistic, but twerking and, and being half naked, she would wear a lot, you know, around, it was really funny around 1970, there was a fashion of having, uh, now it's back, as I say in 19, uh, in 2000. 22, where the skirts are like barely covering the bum and the, but at the same time, they had these things called maxi skirts where they were down to your, your ankles. And, um, it's funny because I actually have a skirt like that. You know, they still make those long skirts nowadays, but it was like those two extremes, you know? And, um, Nowadays, a lot of female artists show a lot of skin. She did not. She was wearing a lot of dresses, uh, long skirts and things like that. And yet she still could convey that sensuality. You know, you don't have to do that. It's actually sexier to kind of suggest something than to just like give away the company store like that. Um, <laughs> um, so... Well, that's my opinion anyway. But uh, so let's see what else did she have. Um, she had Uranus in the 11th house. This is really being to me on the pulse of the generation. Um, she had a cult following. I, You know, she wasn't like one of those people that filled stadiums. But she, but she really tuned into the times. She was a free spirit of that era, even going into the 70s. Um, so but tuned into um, her generation and what it stood for. Because I've done a video on this Neptune and Libra. Um, this is a generational influence for the, the 60s generation. And uh, for sure, she had that Renaissance period that um, People that were born in the 40s, I can't remember the end date of uh, Neptune and Libra. It was go going into the 50s, um, I think, yeah. And that, that because when they were, somebody who was born in 1945, they saw the Beatles when they were in their late, 20, their late teens and the, the younger ones, they were, they were, um, they got that kind of a joy to see that firsthand and the other, the groups and even, you know, even the, the, the birth of rock and roll. And of course it's not just rock and roll, it's all types of music, but that was the music of that generation. That's why I'm mentioning it like that. So it's kind of this mass appreciation of that. And, um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that she was a perfectionist. She was a very she let me just put it this way she was a very eclectic art, artist and she was very true to her to to her art so she wasn't somebody that was looking to capitalize and just jump on trends and do things like that she was very she she that was one of the reasons why people were pulling their hair out in the record studio because uh, recording studio because she was so eccentric in that way that they wanted to make it more commercial and she would uh, stick to her guns uh, when she could. And, um, you know, the moon in Sagittarius wanting to do things your own way, um, emotionally pure, uh, true to yourself. So, and I even think Scorpio is like that, to be honest with you, but her, she had a hard angle between Mercury and Scorp and, um, Pluto, a square. And, you know, her Mercury was in Scorpio and that is one of the Pluto is one of the rulers of it. So it really kind of intensifies that uh, influence. And that idea of the person who is very obsessive about what they're doing, but because it's a square, it's it could uh, get in the way sometimes. And I think that's what happened. And I think she was lucky she did have the producer she had in the beginning, because then I don't believe that she would have ever been on the map necessarily. She might have been an, uh, a performer, but she might not have had a written name recognition like that if, you know, they she didn't 
have somebody overriding her sensibilities about some of the early songs that became hits for other people and was able to make it more of a palatable commercial sound. Um, so uh, that was happening, but I want to, and then there were two things about her love life that I wanted to point out. She had a square between Venus and Mars. I think I said that earlier, and that can indicate someone who is very, um, you know, with the opposite sex, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I said that backwards. And so she had that square. So there was this, this kind of, uh, uh, what do they call that? Like an impasse between her and men. And, um, then she also had a, a conjunction, I actually a square between Venus and Pluto. And that can be this situation where money and sex, um, well, sex, but love, you know, get confused, um, distorted, intermingling together, entwined together, and that creates problems, especially when it's a, a hard angle. So she was not a, um, a gold digger. She had the money. And one of the people that she was, one of the men that she was with, he eventually left because he couldn't handle the fact that she made more money than he did, or that she had more money than he did. Uh, and so that probably wouldn't occur as much today, but in those days when it was much more traditional relationships and women were not the, the primary breadwinners, it might have really threatened the conditioned male who thought that he, that his sense of masculinity was tied into the money that he generated for the, for the household. So that might have been some of, and there was another man in her family thought that he was using her for her money. So th this issue with money and love, you know, was somehow convoluted and, or created some kind of a tension with the square. Um, she had, uh, Mercury square Mars, and that's usually somebody who can fly off the handle. Uh, you know, when they get mad, they can, uh, verbally attack somebody. I never heard that she was mean to people. Uh, Mercury and Scorpio can be very cutting and cruel, but I never heard that she was. So maybe, you know, you can have that tendency and still bite your tongue and, and not do that. Okay. I'm going to end by talking about the fourth house. Of, well, there's a couple of things I want to talk about, uh, the 10th house of career, but let's talk about the fourth house. She had a stellium here. Um, she had the moon, which is a concentration of at least three planets here. She had three planets in the asteroid Chi Chiron. So she had the moon, she had moon and Mercury, Jupiter and Chiron. Um, that's another thing that threw me for a loop, her having Chiron in the fourth, because that could indicate a painful childhood. There's no indication that she had one, but there are pictures of her when she was young. And, you know, I saw a picture where she was smiling, but she just seemed like she was a very intense young person. Or, you know, there wasn't really much of her when she was younger, but like as an adult, um, Mercury and the moon in the fourth house can give a strong, strong memories of the past. Um, actually with the moon in the fourth, the person can be quite sentimental and connected to the mother psychically. She had a very strong connection with her mother. And it's interesting that she died of the same disease, ovarian cancer that her mother died from, because it could be like the psychic connection between the, the mother and daughter. And, um, sometimes this can lead to the person being emotionally trapped in the past. And, you know, now I understand why, why she was the way she was, because 
this, you know, it was uh, at the beginning of the feminist era and she was doing a concert and she was talking about this guru that she was following. And that would be, I would say, the moon in Sagittarius looking, you know, having that philosophical side, looking to be emotionally fulfilled through spiritual means. And she was saying, um, she had asked the guru how she could get this man to love her, which in and of itself is something like a feminist wouldn't even dream of doing, uh, of talking about or actually being like that. But she was a son in Libra. But I was thinking to myself, where did she have these kind of like very old fashioned, um, I, you know, desires for that kind of man that was like the alpha male type of guy. And I think it comes from having the moon in the fourth house, but the guru said to her, you have to be his lover, his friend, his mother, um, <laughs> you know, like you have to be his maid. And then somebody in the audience said, bullshit, like, you know, yelled out. And then she started playing the piano and then she paused and she said, you might think it's bullshit, but I think it's the truth. And the audience, you know, her, her fans just started cheering and everything. But it was very, um, uh, I don't know if you say anachronistic, anachronistic, you know, kind of like out of time, um, backwards, um, old fashioned, but in a bad way, kind of, um, not with the times to, to think like that. I'm not saying that myself, but I think that um, it could be viewed that way. But when you have the moon and Mercury in the third, in the fourth house, you're, you, you will be more traditional in the way that you think and in the way that you feel. And so for a woman looking for a man, she may desire the kind of man who is you know, kind of like an alpha male, like a typical male, not like a sensitive male where she's almost the, the one who's the guy in the relationship. And like I said, she is a triple masculine sun, moon, and, and rising sign, but she preferred wearing dresses. So it just goes to show, I mean, she, I think she was a little bit self-conscious about her weight. She wasn't uh, what we would call super overweight. She was more like curvy or, um, <laughs> I was going to say thick, <laughs> but yeah, just kind of voluptuous. Um, so there's a, there's a very strong traditional streak in her. The moon and, and the fourth can be patriotic, but she was, you know, very anti-war and things like that, but she didn't, she wasn't like an activist on that level. At least I think she did get involved to some degree. I'll have to find out when I read the rest of the book. But during the era when uh, people were protesting uh, the Vietnam War, she wasn't really front and center. Um, and also, she, but she did write a song called Save the Country in 1969. And, you know, I recommend people listen to that song. It's a really good song. It was right after, you know, Martin Luther King had been murdered and uh, Robert um, Kennedy had been murdered in spring, summer of 1968. Um, and then in the 10th house of career, she had the North Node in Taurus. Now Taurus, like Libra, is ruled by Venus. So to have a midheaven of Taurus or Libra can automatically make the person um, choose a career that is involved with beautifying the world. Now, it could be a beautician. It doesn't have to be like a, a, a musician. But then she has her North Node here. So it's like the career and the North Node are one and the same. And this doesn't always happen. The, the, you know, the North Node can be some kind of a soul's urge, but it doesn't mean that that's going to automatically be where you find your fame and fortune and that kind of thing. And what people identify you as the 10th house can be your, um, status in the world. So that doesn't necessarily predict that angle. So, um, it, 
it's pretty much destiny. And some people can really sense that, I think. And they just go for it because they they can't they can't see themselves doing anything else um it's funny this is totally not that it's random but it's like totally uh a little bit different you know different era but i just saw something about justin bieber having to cancel some of his concerts because of a health condition and he said you know i want to you know come back so i can do what i was born to do so that's, and he's very young, you know, he's in his 20s. So people know, and sometimes they just go after things because they know that that's the only destiny for them, uh, that all the other roads lead to this uh, behavior, this situation. So uh, that's what I have about Laura. She was a very enig enigmatic figure. But she produced some amazing, she composed some amazing music. And I hope that you enjoyed this. If you would like a personal reading, the link is below. Take care.